All right, welcome back. This is Managing Information Systems, CSIS uh, 2200. We are carrying on with chapter number three. Uh, chapter number three is dealing with the database component of the managing an information system. It's a very important concept. This is a, uh, a, a discipline, a computer discipline on its own. We're gonna be focusing on database systems, how they're, it's warehoused the data, and what is a data mart. All right, so we're gonna go through and explain uh, what it, exactly a database is and the database management system. We'll look at things like how the what's the difference between a logical and a relational database. The, we're going to define the components uh, of a database management system. Summarize recent trends that, that are going on right now in this area, which is uh, important, very important. You know, explain the components and functions that you could find uh, in here, and this is to help you better understand how to work with these. Like I said, describe the functions of a data mart. And one of the more important aspects of this entire chapter is define the business analytics and describe its role in the decision making process. As I've alluded to in earlier chapters in a managing information system, we do this because we want information. We want to be able to make decisions based on our data. And the database is one of the key components to that. Uh, explain what big data is and its business applications, which actually pertains to the, um, the analytics. And also explain the database marketing and its business applications. All right, now let's have a look at what is a database. We hear this term a lot. And when you look at back from chapters one and two, and we're talking about managing an information system, and one of the first roles in that is to collect data. The second was to manage the data and organize it into a database. Then we're gonna process the data with qu questions that people are asking of the data, and then finally get a report back that they want. All that has to occur inside of a database. So the database is, if you want it to think of it in a general term, it's just a large collection of related data stored in a central location or it could be in multiple locations. Now, when it says here related data, this is a very important term because data has to be correlated together. Now, an example I always give is data, an example of this would be your name. If you think about you're collecting um, a bunch of names, if you just say I want people's first name, that's a data point. That's a field that you're collecting. So in that case, if you're gonna collect someone's first name, your first name doesn't really have much meaning on its own until you collect related data. So another field in related data on that example would be your last name. Now we correlate your first and your last name together, the, the data becomes more, imp, more meaningful because we've got your first and your last name. Now we know what your first and last name is, but even with that, is it that meaningful? It becomes more meaningful, but there could be a lot of people in the world with the same first and last name. So if we correlate that again with another data point with more related data, let's say your birth date, then how many people are born on that day with that first name and that last name? There could be still lots of them out there. But if we correlate even a fourth field, let's say your student number, you put your student number in there and you're starting to see this idea that related data has to be collected inside that database. All right, so I hope that kind of explains a little bit in the early stage here of a database example. Now, the, the data hierarchy is that when we talk about the data hierarchy, we're talking about how is the data organized? How is it structured into fields? And like I've just explained here, that a field is a, is a data point that you wanna collect. An example of a field would be your first name. Another example would be your last name, your student number, your birth date. Uh, now your age, now that's kind of a tricky one because you can collect someone's age, but if you've already collected their birth date, you know what their age is by doing a process calculation. So that field may not be required. Now once that is the structure or the organization of how you wanna collect your data. And when you put a student's information there, you type your name, your first, last name, your birth date, your student number, and all, et cetera, that becomes a record. And each student becomes a record. And finally, if you collect more than one record, it becomes, or potentially becomes a file or a data set. 
There's a couple names that we can use. So what they call here is the data hierarchy is the organization of the data into fields, collecting the data into records, and accumulating records into files. How do we do this? We do it using a database management system or what's commonly known as a DBMS. And there's a lot of these out there. I've shown in other videos in the in the chapter two, I believe. They have many, many different companies out there that create a database management system that pertains to certain industries for collecting certain types of data. So these are out there to help. It's a software program that helps you create and store, maintain and access all those database files. So that's the files of the data hierarchy is the primary goal, primary goal to the DBNS. So it makes use of these databases more effectively, efficiently by being able to ask the DBNS questions to process to get that information. All right, so I hope that kind of explains a bit of this uh, general introduction to the database. So let's get into it a little further. Now, here's a chart that kind of demonstrates how the interaction between you as the user and the database that collects all this information. This is the, the data that's out there. And what ties it all together is the database management system. So it's a software. This is a software tool. And all managing information systems, or pretty much all managing information systems, have a database component. So keep that in mind. When you're in your job, wherever you guys end up working, you're probably going to work with one, if not multiple, database management systems using an, a managing information system, using the database management system. So you can see there's an overlap with this. Uh, it's almost like DBMIS, right? There's, there's a real, this is a component of the, the MIS. All right, here's how it works. You're at work, you're the user, you're using some managing information system. You want to get some information out of the system. You have to, as a user, make a request for the information by accessing the, the graphical user interface of the database management system. That system will then go in and make a request. They call it sometimes a query, uh, a question to the database to search the database to see if that information is available and organize it. Now, what happens, an example of this might be, let's say myself, I want to ask a question. Can you give me a list of all the students in my class? The database management system formulates that question, searches the database, it goes through all the records, and it pulls out only the students that are equal to my class that I've requested. And once I've done that, the database, sen the database sends back to the database management system here, the retrieved information. So this is kind of the process portion. And now what we're doing is we're getting the information section or portion of the, the, the whole process. So that's sent back to the uh, database management system. And then it returns information in the form of a report. And then I get my report. So it goes in as a question and comes out as a report. So you can apply the same model to almost every managing information system that's out there that you guys are going to use in your career when you want to make a request. Now, the, the way that the, the, the questions are presented and the graphical user interface that you use are all going to be different, but this is the general model of how you interact with the database in the managing information system. All right, let's move on to the different types of data. Now, data is, uh, is such a, a critical part of our business community or business and how our business operates and becomes successful and how we just run it. Uh, for example, at Douglas College, if we didn't have a proper database that kept track of all of our students, all of our courses, all of the faculty and put it all together, it would be virtually impossible to run the college. So without this system, this managing information system that we have at the college, it just wouldn't work. Now, the data going into those systems, there's two types, internal data, that we can generate. This is data that we collect within Douglas College, for example. And this is things like not so much sales, but we, well, I guess you could almost consider a students coming in, taking a course, they pay money, it's a sale of a course. Uh, that information gets translated into the finance department, that gets also sent to the, to the marketing department and the human resource. So all of these areas within an organization structure is gonna tap into the data that's collected internally. All right, so that's kind of a repeat. It's storing in an organizational's internal database and can be used to 
by the managing information system. Now we have one in our college is called Banner. And Banner is an Oracle database management system. And we have several people employed at Douglas College and all they do is they manage that system and, and collect internal data. They also collect external data. So external data is data coming from other sources outside. And that could be, now this is not really pertaining to the college of let's say purchase orders that are coming in or sales from transactions that are coming in or inventory management from your inventory from people uh, shipping stuff from other companies or more, uh, leads from other marketing agencies. But there are data. The point here is that there's data coming in from external sources. For example, if we use Douglas College as an example, our international um, department that goes out and markets external sources and collects all that and then provides that information to Douglas College, to our managing information system to help us make better decisions on what kind of courses to offer, how many sections, at what time, in what modality. So without that external data, we wouldn't be able to make those decisions. So my point here, and I know these slides are kind of dry and kind of boring, and <laughs> definitely, but what I'm trying to get across is that wherever you guys work, and I'm giving Douglas as an example, but they're all, every company has similar systems. Without that system, you're not gonna be able to do your business. You guys are probably gonna be working in one of these fields, accounting and marketing, et cetera, programming, or whatever you're doing, and you're gonna be using this. And you have to understand there's data coming in from different sources. What is internal data? What is external data? How are they stored? Where are they stored? And when, the better you understand the data that's collected, the better questions that you can ask of the data source. And that's where you really become a more valuable employee. Because if you can think about more advanced questions or more pertinent questions to get information to management to make a better choice, uh, hopefully to make more uh, courses more productive. An uh, example just kind of came up uh, recently in my area where we were trying to get more data about where students are coming from and getting students from the wait list back into the class to get more students into the classes. And by asking these questions and getting those reports, we can get more students into the classes so they can take those courses and, and better for the college, better for the student. Google Analytics, I put this in here. Um, prim primarily, you guys can click on the link or you can type in Google Analytics and go into the, and learn a little bit about this. This is a, um, a, a Google's way of collecting data and you can actually access external data sources from Google that come into your website. So I just put that in as sort of a supportive link uh, in here. So all this data, internal, external, you know, is, is stored in a data warehouse. And that data warehouse could be on-prem, they call it, or it could be off-prem. Prem is abbreviation for premise, so it's on-premise. So it's in your location, or it can be stored up on the cloud. Really depends on your organization's data and how secure it is. At Douglas College, we have a law in Canada that student information is protected by Canadian law. That means that the servers and the data must be warehoused on in Canada and they cannot be rerouted through American or any other country because we, they don't want data that's gonna be uh, in the hands of other uh, governments so that they can see if a, a student is taking a course outside or if they're moving or whatnot. We, we wanna protect that data. So in Canada, it's very important that the stored data is in a Canadian server on a cloud. And there's a lot of very strict protocols on how that data is then stored. Now, something else I wanna tie in here is for BI. You see this term BI a lot, BI analysts. This is a, an industry on its own. So not only is a managing information systems uh, a job title within a particular company and specialty, not only is database an industry of job titles, but now a new one is called business intelligence, BI, business intelligence analyst. And what they do and they specialize in, and we've got courses here at Douglas and there's some LinkedIn learning courses. And I think there's one I've recommended for you guys to take in the Linda, in the LinkedIn uh, courses is on business intelligence. And it's getting into a little deeper and looking at data warehousing, looking at data, how to ask questions to get more meaningful uh, analytics to get good results coming back from, from your data. All right, let's have a look at methods of accessing files which contain all the data 
and how that impacts our managing information system. So we've got one called sequential access file structure. Now sequential just means one after the other after the other, almost like blockchain, if you guys know what blockchain is. Now you might have seen these old computers with these reels with old magnetic tapes on it and the old movies. Basically you start at one end and you reel through sequentially until you're at the end. And they're good for cheap bulk data storage, but they're not very good for you know uh, accessing data rapidly. So records and files are organized and processed in numeric or sequential order, one after the other after the other. You can't skip and grab whatever you want. So there's advantages to this and there's a disadvantage. Obviously the advantage is that it's uh, sequential, it's organized, it's, it's cheaper uh, to do this. But the downside is that it, you cannot randomly go and grab a record uh, from the middle of the tape because you'd have to fast forward all the way to the middle of the tape and then go all the way back and back and forth. In fact, if you've seen some of these old movies, you'll see these these discs and they're turning back and forth, back and forth. And what you're watching there is a sequential file access structure being accessed randomly almost. But it takes a lot of time to use that. These, this technology is pretty much um, gone the way of, uh, it's, it's almost going extinct nowadays because the cloud technology has pretty much taken over. So records um, are organized based on what they call a primary key, uh, which is the uh, a field that uniquely ad identifies a record. Now an example for you for a primary key here at Douglas College is your student number. A student number is a very specific number that only you have and we, it's a way of us being able to access your record. So if I want record number 30021468 well, if I did it sequentially, I'd have to go through the whole reel until I found that sequential record, which could take hours. If I, uh, if I used a different access way of doing this, uh, which is, you know, it's where you're doing this, um, not sequentially, but it's like a random access, uh, it would be a lot quicker. All right, so, um, so it's definitely slower as I've, I've, I've noted here. Now, there is a, so the sequential record, here's another way of looking at it. You just start at the first piece on the tape and then you look for, is, is, is it in the next position? No, is it in the next position? And you basically go through until you find it. This is very similar to, some of you might have seen these old cassette tapes. You put them in a recorder and you want to listen to a song. Well, that song is song number six. Well, you can't get to six unless you fast forward all the way to this spot to play that song. It's the same with data. If the data is recorded on here, you have to keep fast forwarding to find it. It's slow, it's hard, it's difficult. So to solve the problem, they come up with random access file structures, which means if you want to access record number two, you can jump directly to record number two. Or if, you, if you're if you at two and you want to go back to three, you can go back to three. If you're at three, you can jump over to four. If you're at four, you can go to five. You can go, you can go anywhere you want. And you can put those in order. However they're created, we can then access them randomly. And this is very classical hard drive on a computer that stores data. And the little arm on this, kind of like the old fashioned record arm on a record player, it can actually spin to a particular spot and grab the data that's sitting right here or grab the data that's over here on a different platter. So the random access file structures can record an access in any order, which is great. It, it puts out a lot of flexibility, regardless of its physical location on, on the the storage media it could drop it here or here or wherever it is on a cassette tape and a sequential system you got to put it in sequentially one after the other so the random is definitely fast and very effective um, when you're working with these small record number of records now I say small I mean up to like a million records um, you know which it seems like a lot to most people but and it really depends a lot this technology has changed even in the last few years so uh, this this one here, this um, older sequential technology, isn't even used that much. It's only pr primarily used for doing bulk storage backups. Basically, you take your entire college and you want to back everything up on like once a day, and it just backs everything up sequentially. You're not planning to use it, but if you ever have to restore the system, that's a that's a cheap uh, way of backing up your computer. So records are stored on a magnetic disk to archive. Uh, to achieve the speed. So both of these have magnetic iron oxide that actually allows you to turn those zeros and ones off and on to be able to store the data. 
All right, so now they've got sort of a hybrid, um, which is referred to as an indexed sequential access method or ISAM here. And it allows you to record and access sequentially your data or randomly if you need to just be able to go and access this. So this is a, like the new way where they basically created a hybrid of the two. Um, but this type of, of software and hardware costs a little bit more because you're basically accessing um, the, the data in two separate methods. So records access sequentially or randomly. Uh, it can randomly access using a small amount of numbers. And how does that do that? Well, uh, it's on a, it basically goes through and it, it records a registry with a location of where the data sits on another um, device or another platter. And it basically gives it an address where it can then go to that address directly and access it. Or it can do it sequentially down this list. So that's a very uh, brief example of how this works. But I think from, uh, from a student's understanding, you, you need to understand that there's really three different ways of accessing data. You know, you got the sequential, the random access, and the index sequential access method are the, are the different types. All right, so definitely go in, have a read through that in the book uh, because uh, that is um, explained a little bit further. And I think there's a, a quiz question or two and one on the midterm on that. So maybe uh, have a quick read through that. All right, moving on to the logical database design. Well, logical, uh, what they're talking about here is that information or the data that's, that's stored in a database is can be viewed in two separate ways. One is referred to as the physical view, which is basically how the data is physically stored and retrieved on the, the, the um, storage media, whether it's a hard drive or a tape drive. Uh, and it's usually physically organized on the disk. So it's organized as it was entered. So as it's entered, it's just sequentially entered into the physical uh, media. Now, the second way of doing this is a logical view. So the logical view is how information appears to the user and how it can be organized and retrieved. So it's this is how we, we look at things. Uh, humans look at things in a logical view because we want to see the data the way we want to see it. But how the data is actually stored is a physical view. So that kind of makes sense. Data is stored physically, but we want to look at it in the way we want to look at it that makes sense, which is logical view. So keep in mind that there's two ways the, the, the data can be uh, viewed, and that's a physical view, which is actually how the data is organized and how it was entered. And logical view is how we want to, to, to see the data and how we want to retrieve the information. Now, the nice thing about the logical view is there are different people with different logic or different ways of looking at things. Just like in life, people look at things differently. We can look at data differently. And then that's actually a good thing. We want you to think about how do you want to view the data compared to your colleagues might look at the data slightly different. So you want to start thinking about understanding, first of all, the data so that you can come up with ways of logically looking at the data. So it really depends on the user and you can have more than one logical view of the data. So you can have multiple sorted views. So that means that you can have basically a request to look at the data in uh, multiple requests to have different logical views. Physical view, well, there's pretty much just one. It's physical, it's on the tape, it was entered that way, and that's it. But logical, you can have multiple views that you can do that. All right, well, I think I'm going to stop this video at this point, and I will see you in the next one.